Dr. Cara Fitzgerald is a functional medicine practitioner who maintains a private practice in Sandy Hook, Connecticut, and is on the faculty of the Institute of Functional Medicine. She was the lead author of a paper recently published in Aging, Potential Reversal of Epigenetic Age Using a Diet and Lifestyle Intervention, a pilot randomized clinical trial. And with that, let me start the interview. Hello, Dr. Fitzgerald. You are the clinic director of the Sandy Hook Clinic. Uh, welcome to Modern Health Span, and thank you so much for joining us today. Absolutely, it's a it's a pleasure and honor to be with you. I, I appreciate what you're doing out there and asking the good questions in this arena. Oh, thank you so much. That's, that means a lot. Um, so, could we start off with with a big question? So, what is your theory of aging? So, why do we age? I mean, mechanistically, what happens that causes us to age? Is it programmed, or is it just accumulation of damage? I get. I, you know, that's a that's such a good question. I think. Um, well, I think it's probably both, but I think the over. I, I think it's it's probably a programmed event. I mean, that's that's as I as I really dive into epigenetics and in particular, my attention has been around DNA methylation. Mm. It's, it seems to be a potent director of traffic at all life stages, including aging and aging seems to uh, uh, cha- changes in DNA methylation patterns seem to be as pronounced and powerful as say in embryogenesis. It's, it's really quite extraordinary. Right. Excellent. Uh, yes. I mean, it, it, I guess the, the changes are still predictable even as you get older. And, uh, yes. And they're like, they're sort of, they're, 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 I mean, I, I'm not excited about experiencing these changes myself as I, as I, you know, move into my middle fifties, but um, they're almost, they're like as elegant sort of equal opposite to the extraordinarily exquisite um uh, activities of methylation and demethylation during epigenesis. So, I, I mean, uh, yeah, gr- well, during during um, embryogenesis, mm-hmm. excuse me, and gametogenesis. So it's, um, you know, it's really extraordinary. It's kind of like the equal and opposite reaction, sort of as powerful as impactful, sort of bringing us into life and then mm-hmm. taking us out of life. And and methylation seems to be playing a really big role, right, right at the center. Right. So. Staying with methylation, so in your study, you used uh, the Harvard, Harvard clock as an endpoint, mm-hmm. uh, the 2013 mm-hmm. version. Yes. But as you, I think as you noted in the paper, so th- this kind of depends on um, being younger in, being epigenetically younger means that you really are younger, right? Yeah. Uh, so what are, your thoughts, <laughs> what are your thoughts on that now? <laughs> do, do, you, do you think that that is correct? Um. I think so. I mean, I, I I think so. That's where I'm hedging my bet in this in this area of investigation. Um, fortunately, in order for one to get epigenetically younger, one is eating a diet that's rich in antioxidants, that's anti-inflammatory. I mean, you're doing sort of the 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 wear and tear theory. You're doing the things to turn those around. You're 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 addressing that also. Um, I think both, so I do think there's this overarch, overarching programmed theme that we're starting to unpack, but I do think obviously damage is a, is a real mm-hmm. thing that happens. And, you know, fortunately our intervention, I think, you know, addresses, addresses both of those. Right. So uh, one other question kind of on clocks. So back, back when you started, uh, I think there was probably, there, there weren't many clocks, right? There was, That's Horvath, right. and Just Horvath was the main one. Yes. Uh, so if you did it again, if you were going to run the study now, yes. which clock would you choose or choose. how would you think about choosing a clock? Yeah, absolutely. That's a good, that's a great question. So we are in fact re- recruiting oh. now. So you can go to our, our site. It's not a university run, you know, randomized control trial. This is a participant funded uh, uh uh, 100 person sort of beta launch. Um, mm. So if you if you go to our 
website, which is my name, Dr. DrKaraFitzgerald.com, um, right on the landing page, there'll be information to direct people uh, to that offering. We have incidentally applied for an NIH grant, so hopefully we'll be able to do a randomized control trial as well. And yeah, absolutely. So for, for starters, we'll collect blood. I think that, um, I, I don't think saliva is the appropriate mm. specimen for really getting a good mm. clock snapshot. So that's something that we would do differently. I hope at some point, like we can use a buckle swab um, to get a reliable estimate because it's much easier to collect. I mean, doing a, a, a study like this in, in um, you know, in the sort of national landscape where anybody can jump in and participate, having to collect adequate blood um, is, is difficult. It can be difficult, but we're we're doing so. We're definitely doing blood, and we're going to do a suite of clocks. Um, we'll definitely do the 2013 again, but we'll do all of the so-called the the next generation clocks, like Grim and PhenoAge, and um, you know some of the others. Right. Uh, interesting. Yeah, it would be good to yeah. compare them. Actually, see see how the results go. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's exciting. I mean, and, and we'll hopefully continue in this direction. We're building out a, a digital program where people can kind of follow exactly what we did in the study and then and 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 opt to participate in data gathering, opt to participate in research or not. And then I want to kind of blast into the next level of this where, you know, our our program is is layerable into any intervention. I was I was just I was listening to Greg Fay recently talk about you know the the trim the next trim study that they're doing and you know those folks have to eat so why not layer something like this that has some interesting evidence behind it and and that's how we started in clinic practice we we use elements of the methylation diet and lifestyle and in. in, in in all of our patients. I mean, it just kind of layers into um, anything really quite well, uh, you know, including caloric restriction or intermittent fasting. So I think, I think these tools that we've kind of landed on, I, I, and I know we need to continue to research it, but, uh, you know, are, are, are usable across, you know, a, a broad swath of, um, you know, anti, other anti-aging interventions. I don't think they conflict. Right, yes, yes. Um, so what I'd like to kind of talk about is, is the paper that you, you wrote, um, which was you know, really interesting and, and was, I think, the first, well, actually, you said that there was one that won before, but I, it was like the first one I was aware that where uh, you used lifestyle intervention to move the clock oh. back. Yeah. Yeah. So can you give us some history of the study? So why did you start it? I mean, wh why did you pick this one to study? Um, and yeah. what was your confidence that you would actually be able to achieve <laughs> the epigenetic age? <laughs> I was, I was perhaps cavalierly confident that we would shift epigenetic expression. I mean, mm. that we would see changes to DNA methylation patterns. I mean, you know, most scientists, suggest that you need to hang in there with an intervention much longer, like six months or so. Mm. Um, and yet, if you look at the literature, I mean, you can see um, there was one study uh, published not too long ago looking at exposure to, you know, four hours of kind of city pollution really significantly uh, introducing uh, DNA, you know, differential patterning, you know, on the, on, 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 on the methylation mark. So, I mean, you can get, dive into the literature and see that changes can happen, obviously, really quickly. There's a continuum, though, right? There, there are genes that are going to be way more labile because they have to respond immediately to environmental inputs. And then there are going to be those, obviously, like, you know, DNA methyl methylation of chromosomes, which, you know, in theory should be, you know, resilient and kind of maintained um, over many cell divisions and so forth. So there's this real continuum. Um, so I was confident that we would see, if we drilled down into the data, we would see some changes happening. But, you know, <laughs> I went in there confident knowing that we would see some changes and came out just very, obviously, very, very excited. Right. Because back in 2017, which I think was when you started, I, that was kind of before the trim results were published and... So, so I don't think it had been done 
in, in a clinical trial. Naivete. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. Right. Well, let me just tell you our entry into this conversation, entry hmm. into DNA methylation slash epigenetics. And I think that'll help kind of inform uh, our direction. So we, I got into DNA methylation you know, probably around 2013 or so when I started to spend time with the literature and the bulk of the literature at that time was looking at um, aberrant DNA methylation patterns in cancer. I mean, just loads and loads of, of science around that. I mean, re remember, I'm a clinician, so I'm thinking about patient care. Mm -hmm. um, and what was clear with regard to cancer is that it very, you know, the tumor microenvironment extraordinarily efficiently takes, hijacks the epigenetic machinery extraordinarily efficiently. It turns off, you know, via DNA methylation. There's obviously other epigenetic uh, processes happening, but I think DNA methylation is one of the key players for reasons that we can circle back to if you want to in a minute. But you can see that these guys, it, that, that the tumor microenvironment very potently hijacks epigenetic expression for its own survival. So you see tumor suppressor genes turned off. You see oncogenes turned on, you know, predictably. Um, and so as I read that, being in functional medicine, uh, my question was actually, you know, and I have a background in clinical lab. I did a doctorate in, uh, excuse me, a postdoctorate training in, 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 in a clinical, in a, a kind of a sophisticated um, specialty clinical laboratory where we were looking at interesting uh, biomarkers like organic acids. We were looking at, you know, Krebs cycle intermediates. We were looking at amino acids and so on and so forth. So we were really kind of ahead of the curve. One of the areas of, of, of interest for us at the lab and, and for the clinicians who, who utilized the lab was the methylation cycle. Um, you know, just looking at as many biomarkers associated with the methylation cycle. And of course, homocysteine is cornerstone, but, you know, as acidenosyl homocysteine and acidenosyl methionine and methionine itself and the various cofactors and so on and so forth. And we put a lot of time into supporting optimizing methylation as measured by the biomarkers in the methylation cycle. So our attention was on the methylation cycle itself. Uh, you flash forward, you know, my read on the literature in cancer, um, the, the sort of the slap in the face, if you will, was uh, if we are pushing methylation forward in our patients, which we tend to do, are we promoting the hypermethylation that's happening in the tumor microenvironment? So could we actually be doing harm to our patients? And that was the big aha for me and my entry into this conversation. From that, with my nutrition director, we've got a large nutrition program here at our, at our clinic. Um, my nutrition director, Romilly Hodges, and I decided that we needed an upstream approach to optimizing methylation that um, was based in diet. So if you look in the literature around um, any, you know, untoward side effects with, you know, using a, a nutrient forward program, there aren't any. We know that by and large, they're very protective. And at the least, they're, you know, at the worst case, they're new, it's, it's neutral. Uh, so we began to think about balancing methylation via the diet. And then when you continue to drill down into the literature, you'll see that exercise, you know, sufficient sleep, uh, you know, stress reduction, all of these have data. And this was in 2017 on, or even, and, and even earlier on uh, improving DNA methylation or genetic methylation in general. And so that was the the, 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 the genesis of our program, um, the, the extraordinary leap came when I began to realize, and you know, this was over a course, we were using it in practice. And, and so I, I should actually say that we were using it in practice um, routinely um, with the intent that we were uh, changing epigenetic expression, but we didn't know it. And, you know, our study, hiring a university to run a randomized control trial is expensive. And so, you know, Romilly and I would dialogue about how we might be able to research it and, and you know, do we do, uh, 
you know, use a, 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 a subjective uh, validated questionnaire and, and get people to participate through Facebook? I mean, do we measure homocysteine? Like, how do we actually look at, how do we put the, our money where our mouths are and, and see whether we're influencing epigenetic expression? And it, and it was, you know, <laughs> we, we were just, we were, we were gifted with an unrestricted grant, uh, meaning they had no involvement at all in study design. And that was from uh, a supplement company, Metagenics. Uh, and, and, and so it was just this extraordinary ability for us to be able to test this program. Their CEO, Brent Eck, just had, had good faith in us and was also looking at some of the literature around um, aberrant methylation perhaps being driven by supplement, you know, being driven by sort of overdosing on B vitamins and so forth. And I want to say that I use B vitamins for anybody who's anxious. I prescribe them all the time in practice and there's a time and a place for them, but I definitely appreciate um, a more nuanced approach. So my, my, my thinking around that, or actually our, our clinic in general has, has changed a lot now that we've looked at methylation. So this is our foundation for entry into the conversation, you know, the read on the literature around cancer, but then this is the this is the programmed aging idea coming in. You begin to see that these same patterns are happening in all of the chronic diseases of aging and aging itself. I mean, Goodall, Peggy Goodall, in her laboratory did this really, you know, series of cool studies over over a long time where they're looking at stem cell regeneration in mice, and one of the and you see the you see the changes in methylation patterns occurring in healthy old mice that look like uh, cancer, like the, 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 the tumor microenvironment. Like, so the, it, 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 it just began to, you know, a pattern began to emerge to me that sourced back to the aging journey itself. It was an extraordinary awakening. You know, it really was. And then I, and then, I mean, a lot of, you know, you and a lot of the folks that you interview are already landed here, like let's address aging itself, but me being in functional medicine where we're sort of the clinical application of systems medicine, I'm thinking whole person, I'm thinking, uh, you know, autoimmune, like I'm actually, I'm thinking whole person, but I am still sort of compartmentalizing. You have an autoimmune disease, you have a cardiovascular disease, you've got a cardiometabolic disease, et cetera. And it was a, it was a aha, you know, a, a growth experience that continues to occur with me that um, the, 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 the DNA methylation, the aberrant changes in epigenetic expression and particularly DNA methylation that we see in aging, if we address those, this cascade potential to addressing all concurrently, all chronic disease begins to emerge. And I mean, it's, it's just extraordinary and, and, and mind blowing. It's been quite a game changer for me. So let me stop there. <laughs> right. Yeah, no, that was, that was really interesting. And, and yes, uh, a lot of the people that I talked to, they, yeah, the, the, the idea is that you address the aging and that solves everything else. And, and I hope that you found the video informative. Please do hit the thumbs up button, subscribe to our channel and hit the bell button for any new video release notifications. Thank you so much for your kind support. I wish you all well and we'll speak to you again soon.